we had a fantastic plenary to today uh, talking about the digital economy and then the discussion continued in the subsequent session on the alternate business presence i'm joined by gary from baker and mckenzie uh, and kuntal from india uh, gary uh, your take on the two or three key challenges that are being adopted in the current taxation for the digital economy particularly we have eu proposal which is an interim measure and then a long term measure of creating some sort of a digital presence what are the one or two challenges that you foresee in both these approaches well the main challenge of course is to create consensus because at the moment there is no consensus that either one of those proposals is the appropriate way to go um we 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 certainly heard from both panels today that there's a wide variety of views um mr Sangupta of India was very adamant that India wants some increased taxation rights but I don't think that is held by a large number of other countries and so it's going to be up to the OECD to figure out how to come up with a consensus that involves everyone right uh, in the afternoon panel today uh, when the nexus was being talked about other than the users and revenue there was a interesting thought about allocating some revenue with reference to the capital as well uh, and capital in the context of technology companies being the commitment to the intangibles your thought on this uh, alternative uh, proposal as well yeah. well that's that's a new entrant into the discussion um i'm a little skeptical as to whether investments in technology really should be treated differently than investments in capital equipment they're both capital you know one is intellectual capital the other is physical capital but if you're going to use either one to provide a service to a market why should that service be taxed differently because it's facilitated by intellectual capital as opposed to tangible capital right so so that that was the element of the theory that I didn't quite understand whether there there was another reason besides the difference between intellectual capital and tangible capital that would suggest that taxation rights for companies that exploit those different types of capital ought to be determined differently right uh, kuntal uh, uh, gary mentioned about india stand being uh, sort of adamant uh, on the digital economy uh, taxation we've been um, sort of front runners when it comes to the implementation of digital equalization levy and now the significant economic presence your take on uh, uh, how the panels went and the india's position so i think the panel gave very broad and at the same time a uh, very important outcome that this is going to be a very challenging and a most debated concept and as gary rightly mentioned the challenge is going to be on how do we get consensus on the subject and talking about the user data and the valuation attached to the user data i think we can already see a uh, headwinds on that like if you would have examined the mastercard decision there is a specific reference by the authority they were examining in fact uh, the significance of the cost of mip while deciding on the concept of pe and they have mentioned that the uh, the it is very important to examine uh, the place where the server is located and the data resting on the server especially in the time when that data or the information is sold so we can now expect that going forward when there is a commercial exploitation of the user data or the any information which is resting on the server outside of india we can expect some new way of taxing that in india so there is already you know awareness amongst the revenue officers and also all the tax policy makers that there is an issue out there and we really need to ensure that we are not left behind in this debate and they want to have their right of share also right uh, gary just continuing on this point uh, there was a reference to avoided pe concept uh, in in your panel mm -hmm. uh, countries like india even without legislation are sort of looking at uh, taxing virtual pe's do you think this will be a new normal to tax virtual pe's no yet because that's not the law i mean the, that's why i reacted to that concept of avoided pe you know, the law does define what a pe is if a business operates up to but not across the pe line then there's no pe and i think it's a political statement to say that you know these 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 policy ideas are trying to solve the problem of the avoided pe 
It's just that the line today is drawn here, not there. And if you have your business operations to here, you don't have a PE. Now that's different from the question of whether the line should be changed, right? So that is the debate over the virtual PE. Um, that would be a change. It would represent a significant change in the expectation of how taxation rights are allocated from resident state to source states. There must be an agreement among all the resident states to give up taxation rights for this to work out because otherwise you have double taxation almost by definition and no business wants that. So if a virtual PE becomes more common, um, it can only become more common in my view if the treaties are renegotiated to make sure that the resident state is giving up exactly the same amount of taxing rights that the source state is, is claiming. Will it become, to your question, the new normal? Um, I don't know. Yeah. Um, again, India has, has stated that it is now India's treaty negotiation policy to get their treaty partners to put this in the treaties, but we'll see how many treaty partners um, agree. Right. Kuntal, last question. Uh, do you think virtual PE be the new normal? And any one or two takeaways uh, from the panels uh, that you heard today? No, so I think Gary also brought this point out that there is a very thin line dividing between what activities are being carried out and where those activities are carried out. And this thin line is very important also to determine whether the activities carried out are uh, preparatory and auxiliary or main purpose activity. And the way in which MasterCard decision has analyzed the subject, like one will say that even if there are significant activities carried outside of India, there are some significant activities carried out inside the India. So I can't understand how can you have a proposition that you will have significant activities being carried out both in India as well as outside of India. And also you can see the way in which uh, the analysis of the factual pattern takes place uh, before the authorities now. Like uh, even though there is a conclusion, I'm again going to MasterCard case, uh, there is a conclusion that the main task is regard to the authorization of a transaction. The approval is done by the bank at India. Then also the view has been that the role played by MIP is significant. So this is going to really go to the very heart of the subject. Right. And I think today we are looking at a situation where the outcome or decision is driven perhaps in my view more by the view and the understanding of the authority rather than necessarily what is the spirit of the law or what is exactly been stated in the law. And I think this decision, especially MasterCard and other such decisions, will be therefore has to be tested how far they are cogent and how far they are going to be persuasive in their nature. Right. Uh, enjoying the Congress, uh, Gary? Absolutely. If if is always a marvelous place. Um, get to meet people from all over the world and debate interesting topics. Thank you so much, uh, Gary and Kuntal, for Thank joining. You. Thank, Thank you. you so much.